everybody. My name is Ron Perry. I am representing Eastern Group Consulting, and I'm proud today to be able to introduce Ote Smith, who is with RLJ Equity Partners. He is a managing director there. RLJ, I mean, RLJ. Ote, I'll turn it over to you. I appreciate it, Ron. Um, it's a pleasure to be a part of this conference. And for all the attendees, I'll do my best to uh, impart what little bit of wisdom I have on private equity and and really what it takes to have a successful business and, and on the flip side, a successful investment. Uh, so, so Ron, you know, the floor is yours. Feel free to uh, to ask me any questions that you may have and, and I'll share what I know. Uh, great. So I think the first thing uh, I would be very interested in is to tell me a little bit more about your background and what got you uh, interested in private equity? How much time do we have, man? Uh, <laughs> so so uh, my, my background is, is simple. I think it's important that people have a context for my foundation. I, I, um, I'm from a, a lower middle class family. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia area in a suburb called Glen Allen. Um, and, you know, grew up in a situation where uh, education was really stressed and it was a very close knit community. So I think that that foundation created an atmosphere where all of us, all the young guys, um, and, and, and women that I grew up with, we all felt like we had the ability to be whatever we wanted to be. Um, despite the fact that at the time we didn't know it, we were relatively uh, under-resourced. But what that did for me, it really sparked an interest in education, always uh, had a strong work ethic, um, and just really, really just focused on being the best I could be. Um, upon graduation from high school, I made the decision to go to Morehouse College. Um, I had a buddy from my neighborhood who was down there uh, in Atlanta, and he was absolutely thriving. Uh, he was knocking the cover off the ball, one of the top finance students there, and I wanted to follow in his footsteps. So I made the decision to go to Morehouse. I also wanted to be a part of a strong uh, pedigreed and uh, very much uh, positive impacting uh, group of alumni. Uh, and, you know, most of whom everyone knows, kind of, you know, Martin Luther King, Howard Thurman, Spike Lee, Sam, Sam Jackson, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there's so many others uh, whose names don't necessarily uh, come up, you know, every day or every year uh, that have really made an impact, not only on our communities, but, but also the world. And so I wanted to be a part of that alumni community. But I, I went to Morehouse College with the intention of becoming an educational psychologist. I wanted to have the ability to affect and impact um, the way that students were learning, particularly in our community. And so one way to do that was to learn more about curriculum pedagogy, et cetera, and, and really figure out a way to influence things that way. Um, that said, and, and, and please don't judge me for those out there, um, my same friend uh, was two years ahead of me, was graduating in 1997. He said, Ote, I'm so happy. And I said, what's going on, man? He says, after graduation, I'm going to join a consulting firm. Uh, I'm going to be uh, covering uh, private equity, working at a consulting firm, and I'm going to make $42,500 a year in 1997. And I couldn't believe it. A uh, 22 year old was probably going to be making the, the equivalent of what my mom was making as an educator in Richmond, if not more. And I said, wow, this business thing could be real. Maybe I should think about it. I thought about the fact that I could be in school for the next, um, you know, three to four years post graduation from undergrad if I wanted to go the educational psychology route. Um, and I just didn't decide, you know, maybe graduate school wasn't for me, but one thing I could do was maybe major in finance and minor in psychology. And I knew that I could always go back to doing that. So I switched my major and uh, to make the long story short, um, thrived in it, did well, finished number two in the class as a result of making that switch, got some strong internship opportunities. One thing led to another and upon graduation uh, was offered a job at, at Goldman Sachs in their mergers and acquisitions department. Um, and, and the interesting thing there about Goldman, and, and you haven't asked this, but I, I can see where this may be going is really, so what led effect, you know, at, at the end of the day, you led me to private equity. Um, you know, obviously had no clue what investment banking was when I came to Morehouse. And when I got to Goldman, didn't know what private equity was. So learn about private equity while I was at Goldman Sachs. And so you go there, it's a two year program, you work your butt off. Uh, you know, you get an apartment in Brooklyn, as was my case, and you spend very little time in, in that apartment and a whole lot of time at work. Um, in return for that, you're paid a little bit, but more importantly, you're giving life skills that I never would have gotten had I not been able to gain access to, to Wall Street, frankly. 
um, those skill sets were uh, not only um, hard skills and finance, Excel modeling, um, but it was also a lot of skills around um, selling, uh, how to communicate better and effectively, uh, and how to think strategically about businesses. The next step in natural maturation for me was probably to say, hey, do I want to continue being over the next two to three years an investment banker working at Goldman Sachs, or did I want to move on and do private equity or some other field? I chose private equity primarily because it was a good mix based on my limited knowledge of what was going to be some operational uh, development, strategic strategy development, but also finance as well. And I wanted the opportunity to learn more about businesses that way. But there was one thing that I also noticed, um, one attribute about me that I'm absolutely aware of and I think is positive is that I'm self-aware. I knew that I also wanted to go to be part of a private equity firm that was somewhat differentiated. Um, I wanted to be a part of a growing smaller base that was, had a strong team culture and, and, and frankly, that was starting up. Uh, that would allow me one, to get exposure to private equity like I wanted, but also put me in a position to learn how the business truly works and maybe eventually someday to maybe be in a position to start my own fund. So I, I went to Chicago, worked three years at what was then a startup private equity fund. It was a great ride, helped raise some of the capital there, um, was, was on the ground floor learning from the guys who founded the firm um, and, and, and actually did two to three investments before going off to business school at Harvard. And I went to Harvard knowing there were some things I needed to improve on. So I took the education absolutely serious, went there uh, very focused on, on, on uh, refining some of my skills, uh, developing a strong network and positioning myself to continue a career in private equity. Uh, so upon my graduation from business school, I, I was able to join RLJ Equity Partners, which happened to be starting in the year I was graduating. And I was one of the first two hires at RLJ Equity Partners. And the rest is history, been here since uh, 2006, so going on 15 years. Well, that's great. And as I, I smile because I miss those days when you're young and you just work all the time. That's when we all had energy. Uh, so yeah, just your apartment's just a place where your stuff it stays. <laughs> No, nothing more, nothing less. Exactly. So I think that's a great, uh, you talked about the foundational pieces, what led you from an education and obviously the pragmatics of professional working at Goldman. I would also be curious now that, so knowing this, what do you do at RLJ? Talk to me a little bit more. Oh, also, goodness, Robert man. Johnson story. <laughs> but, so uh, I can start with the Robert Johnson story. Um, and, and I'm sure many of you know it, but um, to, to, to really get through it fast, um, if you think about it, what, what Bob Johnson did with BET was that uh, we all know the story about the investment thesis is that uh, he wanted to create, um, you know, um, a whole bunch of uh, programming from a television perspective using cable that was targeted to a certain demographic. That, that demographic happened to be African-Americans. He understood us, he understood our culture, and he knew that there was a strong business case there. And so he created the network. The, 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 the part that I think is most appropriate for, for maybe this audience is, is not so much his overall story, but think about this. At one point, he obviously started the company, he scaled the company, and then he eventually got to the point where he needed a little bit more support from a capital perspective to really grow it, but still under his ownership. And so he partnered with a gentleman by the name of John Malone. And what John Malone did with them was that he happened to be someone who understood the media landscape and gave Bob uh, some debt as opposed to equity because he always wanted Bob to make sure that he had a strong equity ownership in the business because at a certain point, if, you're, if you take too much equity from someone, that can result in a situation where you're working from that individual as opposed to yourself. And he knew that Bob had a strong entrepreneurial spirit and allowed him uh, to structure the deal in a way that allowed Bob to have a significant amount of ownership. But the key thing there is that he was able to really, really grow the business, eventually take it public. He felt like it was undervalued in, in the public market at some point, and Bob actually bought it back in a, in a go private transaction. That effectively is an LBO, if you think about it. That is a leverage buyout, and that's what private equity is. He saw an opportunity to buy back um, from, from the public a business that, in his view, was undervalued and still had a significant amount of potential. So he acquired the company back and eventually continued to grow it and scale it, and the rest is history. Sold it to Viacom for $3 billion or so, became uh, the first African-American billionaire, 
uh, and the rest is history. But based on that success, Bob was able to, uh, one, get into private equity on the real estate side. Uh, today, he is now the um, one of the key shareholders and chairman of uh, the largest publicly traded REIT focused on real estate assets. But he also leveraged the experience on that REIT uh, business to get into private equity on the more traditional side. So he partnered with the founders of the Carlisle Group and he started RLJ Equity Partners in 2006. Um, and we have had two funds um, and we've done you know, 15 plus deals over the last 15 years. Um, and, and we've had a good time doing it. Oh, very good. So when I, so great story, I guess the question is, and it'll be very helpful for everybody. We're throwing all these terms and I'll admit, I'm very, you know, I'm always learning brand new. I'm like, okay, did I know this? You hear about terms going back to Reza Lewis, like what exactly private equity, LBO, what does all this stuff mean? Walk me through like your day in the life of you. <laughs> private equity. What, what is private equity? Um, private equity is exactly what the definition says. It is essentially providing equity uh, to entrepreneurs um, and people who are running businesses in a private fashion and really working with that management team to grow the business, hopefully to create some type of uh, profitable return. Um, the best way to describe private equity, frankly, is to probably give you an example of it. Um, and so uh, let's think about this. Let's just say, Ron, you, you own a fruit stand, right? Um, and, and the fruit stand generates, let's just say, $100 of, of revenue a year and, and $10 of profit. And, and, and this is important that you guys, everyone pay attention to the $10 of profit because we're always focused on profitability. We're focused on cash flow. We call that EBDA. But let's just call it profit here. So, Ron, you've made the decision to listen. Over the years, you've seen that, that profit and your revenue increase. You know that your business is really based in your neighborhood, but you think there's an opportunity to take this from neighborhood to neighborhood, eventually throughout the city, and maybe even expand throughout the state. The problem is, is that you don't have enough capital to build out all those different fruit stands. So what you'll do in that situation is you may say, hey, you know, Ote, someone told me that you have invested in about six fruit stand companies over the last three or four years. Um, I would love to see whether or not you think there's a deal and an opportunity uh, in it for me and you to partner. And uh, the bottom line is I say, listen, Ron, let me take a look at your business. Let me see all your books, all your records, et cetera. And we go through this really detailed uh, diligence process and we ultimately uh, come to agreement on terms and, and strike a deal. So in this situation, let's just say I paid 10 times the $10 of profit that you generated last year. So that means I'm paying you a hundred bucks. In order for me to execute this transaction, I need to go out and get some debt. And I, because I work at a fund, have the equity. Just like buying a home, I'm gonna get $60 of debt. I'm gonna provide $40 of equity. You're gonna be in that $40 of equity. So maybe you put up $10 of that 40 or $20 of that 40, it doesn't matter. But let's just say that going forward, that we're gonna pay $100 for your company, $60 of debt, $40 of equity. Over the next five years, we work our, uh, like gangbusters to really grow this business. Not only did we make it a statewide fruit stand, now we have locations all throughout the region. And so now we say, listen, Ote, I know that these private equity transactions are such that they are, they're not marriages. They, it's, it's, it's more of a courtship and a partnership that always comes to an end because you have to sell the company in order to deliver returns back to your, your investors. And I say, absolutely. And I say, Ron, you're getting tired, man. And you've done well. You probably have enough money now that you might want to retire based on the success of this company. And you said, you know what? Absolutely. So what we'll do is we'll say, let's take it to market. So remember, we bought this business for 100 bucks. We financed it at $60 of debt, $40 of equity. Let's just say that we've done so well that we're going to sell this business for 200 bucks. And over that time period, we didn't pay down any debt. So now when we sell it, you have $200 that that's going to be coming in. You have to pay off your debt at 60. So now you have residual equity value of $140. So if you do the math, keep in mind that we invested 40, we're taking out 140. So if you think about it, ultimately we made a $100 return. And the way we think about it is we would simply say, hey, we made $140 over 40, which I think translates into roughly uh, Three and a, two and a half times our money if I'm doing the math, three and a half times our money if I'm doing the math right. Um, and so 
That's what we do every day. We're looking for situations where a business has solid free cash flow, the ability to grow, and more importantly, what do I bring to the table to help really uh, help this business grow, help it thrive, so that three, four, five years from now, if I put a dollar in, I can see that dollar uh, be uh, create, uh, turn into three, four, five times that, that amount. And that's what we do. The key thing that I think people need to understand is that what I described is probably something that sounds relatively simple and straightforward. I didn't talk about the fact that there are competitors in the market. I didn't talk about the fact that we need to maybe do some acquisitions to grow. I didn't talk about the fact that the cost of fruit may have gone up substantially, but we're not able to pass through the cost of fruit to our customers. So there are a lot of challenges to come about with owning some of these businesses. So the key thing that we do when, when trying to acquire these businesses is to make sure we assess all the potential risks and make sure that we pay a valuation that's commensurate and it rewards you richly for that risk that you're undertaking. No, I think that's great because as you mentioned, it's, it, I, I love the example. You, you brought it down, it was very straightforward. But you also talked in like talking about the example, you mentioned the fact, hey, it could be six other competitors. So I can imagine you're looking at thousands of trans, you know, thousands of investments or opportunities. So it would be very helpful for me to be able to understand here. What are you looking for, for people to stand out, to be unique, to be attractive, to say, hey, that's someone I want to invest in? Absolutely. And, and there's another myth out there. Um, there are lots and lots of businesses out there and um, that, that, that have the potential to be, um, you know, backed by private equity. Um, th th what private equity firms typically do and what RLJ does is we tend to focus on businesses where we have previous investment experience. So I don't do software like, like what Robert Smith has done a great job of doing. I don't do healthcare deals. Um, obviously, we don't do real estate. Bob has a competing venture that does that. So what we like to say is that we invest in business and industrial services. These are basic businesses. But in doing that, we like businesses where there's a strong market position. And then there are some competitive advantages to the way that you take products to market, services that you provide to your customers. It really differentiate, differentiates you from those that may be competing against you. And one of the most important things and measures of of a strong value add cost, uh, company are two things. The company's growth. So how's the company performed over the last three, four, five years? Two, what does the industry look like with regards to growth? Is it a growing industry? Is it a dynamic industry? Are there some headwinds that would make this a more challenging industry? Um, and then three, we look at something called our margins. And, and I talked about in that example I gave the fruit stand that you had 10% margins. It is critical that we look at margins because one of the things that really is a key underpinning of, of any investment is how stable and recurring are the cash flows. So if you are able to continuously sell your product, sell your service, and do it in a profitable way, the question is, is does that translate into strong, recurring, um, enduringly profitable cash flows? And that's one of the key tenets that we also look for. And the reason why that's important is because oftentimes we're using debt to really juice our returns, right? So if you think about the example I gave you, let's just say we would have had the same growth. We were able to generate um, you know, enough profitability and growth to, to have garnered uh, $200 of value. Think about the fact that we would have put in $100 of, uh, of equity as opposed to using any debt. We would have made $100, uh, because we sold it for 200, but we're still able in a situation where because of, because of debt, we were able to put in $40, take out 140, so the profit is still $100. But we made a profit of $100 using less equity up front. That's why it's so important for us to be able to take out debt. And the reason why we're able to take out debt is because the business has strong cash flows and that allows us to pay down debt and support having a leverage is what we call it in our investments. Um, the other thing, and I think is absolutely the most important thing, and, and this should have been said the first, is the fact that we look for strong management teams. In the lower middle market, the biggest influencer of outcomes is really based on the talent of the management team. Uh, so we look to partner with individuals who are entrepreneurial, who are thoughtful, who are strategic, um, and who really know their business in and out, and are dynamic enough to lead a team in such a way 
if we're going to see some value creation under our ownership and partnership. That's effectively what we're looking for. Uh, you made a good point. Um, in any given year, you can see 800 to 1,000 deals. Uh, we meet with uh, probably 40 to 50 management teams um, each year. Um, and then we end up doing one or two deals, two to three deals. And so the hit ratio is relatively low. And there are a number of reasons why. Um, you know, but, but the biggest one being that it's a competitive industry. There's a lot of capital out there. There's a lot of uh, firms competing to own assets that had all those out attributes that I identified and talked about. And so when you find a situation where a business has a perfect blend or combination of all those positive attributes, and we think that we have the ability to really drive value, and we have a playbook to really help the company grow, that's when we uh, really go hard and, and do our best to make sure that we win that mandate and, and win that company. No, that's great because I think apply what you're saying here. It's more than just having a good idea. You really need to have a model that is extremely, at the end of the day, it's gonna make money and it's gonna be able to grow and scale. And you need to be able to know the fundamentals of what it's gonna to take to be able to do that. And well, I think- Private equity is very process oriented, right? You know, when, when the second we see an opportunity, we run through a process, we put it through a filter, we, just, we, we determine whether or not it's the right fit for us in a way that's just highly systematized and systematic and, and thoughtful. And by the way, we're always refining that, right, as, as we grow and, 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 and uh, think about the business. And then ultimately what that should do is create a situation where you're making a decision as to whether or not you want to invest. And then when you make the decision that you want to invest, that's when you really start to do something that we call uh, confirmatory due diligence, where you're paying consultants, uh, accounting firms, uh, attorneys, et cetera, to help you investigate as to whether or not this is the right uh, asset for you to own. Uh, and we do that, like I said, you know, probably, you know, out of the 50 meetings that we have, maybe 50% of the time we'll go to the next step and try our best to really own that business because everything is not going to fit our little box. Um, and, and what's good for us may not be good for the next firm. And what's good for those other 10 firms may not be good for us. But that's effectively the, R, the RLJ private equity process. Oh, that's great. And I think you also it would also be helpful when companies are looking for VC or private equity, what should they be looking for? How should they look to work with you and also selecting you? Because I think there is a, a lure. There have been TV shows, getting VC money and uh, you know whatever, invest money is great. But I think they're, it's overly romanticized. <laughs> You know what, Ron? I, I think that your question is appropriate for all at, for all types of uh, of capital, right? <clears throat> we all know that historically, the biggest um, wall to growth or even launching a business has, been, at least especially in our community, has been access to capital. And so, when you look to really, let's just say you already have a business and it's and it's growing and it's thriving, but you're looking for some way to really expand and you need some support from capital. Um, the, whether it's venture capital, uh, whether it's private equity, or even a lender relationship, I think the key thing that you need to focus on is, quote unquote, the relationship. You need to ask as many people as possible, look at all their references, even people that aren't, aren't on their reference sheet and say, what was it like to work with Ote? Um, what was he like uh, to work with, uh, it specifically when things got tough? Um, did he come in there saying that he knew more about the business than you? Um, was he, um, was he uh, thoughtful and strategic? Uh, what, did, what expertise did he show? Um, did he show an open mind and willingness to be objective in, in arriving at the right decisions? What other type of resources does RLJ bring to the table? Um, you know, show me examples of how you've had success with uh, businesses in, in my industry. How do you think through things? What else do you bring to the table? You should know all of those different things, even if you're working with a lender, and like I said, or even a, a, you know, an equity partner. That is one of the biggest things that you really should think about when trying to take on a partner. And when you talk specifically about equity, the implication um, is that you're gonna have to exchange ownership for this partnership. Now, they're giving you some capital that you can take out as a dividend or put into the business or keep into the business, but in exchange for that, you're gonna give away some ownership. And in my case, you're giving away control. 
we trust you to run the business, but ultimately to the extent that things go sideways, there may be situations where I have to make hard, fast decisions that may run counter to something that you may wanna do or not. And so remember when you're selecting someone uh, as an equity provider and you're giving up ownership or even possibly giving up a control of your company, uh, just know that that comes with some consequences as well. So you need to choose the right partner. That was great advice. And this, you're like, you're dropping quite a few, uh, you know, nuggets here that are very insightful. I guess I would also ask you, based on that, what information do you recommend people look at? Other uh, resources of information for, you know, afterwards, like, hey, this is like extremely invaluable to me. This is what I go to as my quote unquote Bible as a reference point going forward. So, I'm not unlike a lot of the world. I, I read Wall Street Journal every day. Uh, I have a particular, uh, you know, Google search and constant feed on, um, on on private equity and what's going on in the market. Uh, keep in mind that e even within the private equity market, there, there's segments, right? There's there's these big big private equity firms like Carlisle Group and and, and Blackstone and, and all those guys. And then you have what they deem to be kind of middle market firms. We're actually in the lower middle market. We we felt like we wanted to, to there's this, in our view, is a little bit less competition. And we also felt the ability for us to drive value and create value was going to be with more entrepreneurial businesses that haven't taken on a whole lot of, um, you know, institutionalized capital historically. We want to work with founders. We want to work with individuals who um, are really just, you know, started their company. They wake up one day and they have a business that has 50 million of revenue and uh, they just don't know what to do with it. And, and they want to remain with the company for another five to 10 years or something. And so we say, hey, we're a perfect fit for you. Those are the type of entities that we're looking to work with. Um, but in, in developing a business, one of the things that I would think about too is that, um, you know, um, think about the fact that whenever you start a company, and I'm going to continue to answer your question on resources, whenever people start a company, but this thought just came to mind, is that it's difficult sometimes for people to come to terms with this, that generally speaking, I have a philosophy that when you start a business, you're ultimately starting it to position it for a sale. Um, you know, just like our homes, um, you know, anything that's a, an appreciating asset, one that can continue to have value, we may really like it, do not fall in love with it, right? If someone came in here, if I bought a house today for a hundred bucks, and someone knocked on my door the very next day. It was like, hey, you know, your house, you know, I want to buy your house for 200. And I'm fairly certain that this house is worth 100. Despite the fact that I loved a lot, I love everything about the neighborhood and community, I may want to sell it. I think the businesses are the same thing. At least you create businesses that have the option to sell it, right? Because that way you really can create wealth for your family and your community. Um, and so just remember that. And that's just the core tenet that, that Bob Johnson has always preached to us. But getting back to resources quickly, um, there's just a plethora of information out there. What I would say to, to, to anyone who may be looking for things that I think have really influenced my life specifically, um, you know, Reginald Lewis's story, you know, Watch Your White Guys Have All the Fun is one of the first books that I read on private equity. I think it's a dynamic story. It's as much about uh, the idea and the, uh, and the uh, elements of, of, and fundamentals of doing a buyout as it is uh, as much about what it takes to kind of get things done, uh, especially keeping in mind that Reginald Lewis did this as a black man in the 80s. Um, Built to Sell is a book that was recommended to me by a friend who owns a business. And it goes back to that key notion that you really are creating businesses that have the ability to sell. And if you're doing that, uh, creating a business that has the ability to be sold, ultimately you're creating a business that has a lot of value to yourself and obviously potential worth to the market. And that's what's one thing that you really should be focused on in, in creating and driving growth. One thing that I'll also do is there's tons of information out there on YouTube. Um, you know, I, I follow closely um, the, uh, the rise of, of Robert Smith. He's uh, actually one of my personal financial heroes. Uh, you know, look at him. He's, he's done a great job, not only in the business front, but also in the philanthropic, um, philanthropic uh, perspectives as well. And thinking about all that he's done, um, sp specifically at Morehouse was, was a great opportunity and great situation there. Uh, the, the, the other thing is that um, there's a really good uh, NPR episode where, where Robert Johnson is, um, is, is interviewed, I think it's a podcast, um, and I can send you the link to that, but those are some of the key uh, four things that I would recommend as it relates to uh, resources that are out there.
Oh, that's outstanding. And uh, of course, I think we both went through in school, having someone pay our tuition would have been great. So absolutely, man. <laughs> <laughs> what a great surprise uh, at showing up for graduation. Well, I'm sure the parents are probably happier than the, the uh, students. <laughs> absolutely, man. Absolutely. Um, so just as we close out, uh, this has been great. I thank you very much for your time um, as well, because again, this is extremely invaluable. You've been there, like you said, and you've yep. seen quite a bit of activity. You've been able to benefit quite a bit from the very you know wise individuals around you, along obviously with Robert Johnson, others thereof. Um, if folks wanted to follow up with with you and our, and what have you, what would you recommend? There aren't a lot of OTAs out there. You can Google my name, <laughs> and, and that's not that's not meant to be um, to, to 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 floss at all. Uh, you know, it's just to just to shoot it straight. Uh, I have a LinkedIn as well. Um, I'm out there. And again, it's it's OTA spelled O T E Y last name Smith. Uh, you know, want to be a resource to people, uh, but that's that's where I am. You can find me easily. Now that's great. And so as a wrap up, again, I want to thank you very much for your time and. I really appreciate the resources. We'll put that out there for all the you know, for all the participants. It's a lot of great information. And again, always what I always recommend, always be in that learning mode because you never know what you'll gather or gain. And it just takes little bits of like information and very quickly you'll pick up and overnight you'll become an expert. Absolutely. Thank you for your time, Ron. And to uh, all the attendees, keep thriving, keep striving. We've been in some tough conditions over the past year or so. Uh, we'll get through this. Uh, support your friends, keep your dreams high, and make sure you live your purpose. Thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you very much, Ote. All right, everyone. Thank you.